Good morning and welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship. We are going through the book of Luke. It's always so hard on, on Communion Sunday because my heart seems to, like the Grinch, grow a few sizes, remembering what Jesus has done, you know, suffering the grief and the remembrance of the cost of my sin, and yet rejoicing that I'm free of it and that Jesus took it. So I'm, I'm a little stirred up. But we're going through the book of Luke, and we've hit chapter 6. Uh, you guys been enjoying the book of Luke? I've never taught through the book of Luke before. And uh, I'm, I'm just loving it because I'm seeing themes and I'm seeing all sorts of things that apply to us. And I love the Gospels because they tell us the good news that God loved us and sent the Son to die for us. But not only that, but Jesus came to be an example for us. He lived every single moment of his life with purpose. And he had his eyes on winning us, which is an amazing thing. So we're going to pick it up in chapter 6. Jesus said to them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy? We're going to see two events here. One is the disciples are going to be going through a field on the way to church. We would call it church. And they were on their way to the synagogue. And as they were doing that, they decided they'd scrape off some granola and have a snack on the way to church so their stomachs don't rumble while they're being taught. Have you guys done this? It's a good idea to eat before coming to church. It makes it easier to listen. And then you're not distracted by, what will I eat when church is over? <laughs> so the disciples do that. And then when Jesus actually gets to, uh, on, a, on another Sabbath day, there's a man with a withered hand. And he heals him in front of everyone. That's got to be embarrassing. But Jesus is trying to tell us to get used to something new. Just uh, so you men understand, we're going to be having a, a retreat, and we have a sign-up sheet. So if you're interested, please sign up. And if you guys are interested to accept this calling, uh, I guarantee you it will be meaty. It will be meat on the bone. So you'll enjoy it. Last week... We were looking at chapter 5, or I should say two weeks ago, and we saw Jesus encountering four people in chapter 5. One was Peter, who was the main target of Jesus' audience. He preaches from the boat, and he says, let's go out and get a catch in the middle of the day, Peter. And Peter says, we went out all night, but, you know, because you say we're going to go out. They go out, they get this incredible catch of fish, and then Peter drops to his knees, and he says, Lord, you got to get away from me. I'm, I'm not the guy. I'm, I'm not the guy you want. And Jesus says, from now on, you'll catch men. And then there's a leper that comes to him and is filled with leprosy. The doctor tells us, Dr. Luke, being filled with leprosy means that, that there isn't a place of your body that's not affected by it. And we talked about what that looks like. And Jesus touches him, probably the first person to touch him in so many years, and heals him instantly. It wasn't something that took a period of time. Uh, this is something that it happened instantly and his skin became normal instantly. We looked at verses 17 to 26 where Jesus is having a Bible study and he's teaching a lot of the premier teachers in Jerusalem. And they're all sitting and listening to him teach. People from far away have come to hear him and they're in Peter's house. And there's four, four guys who have a friend who's paralyzed and they want to get him to Jesus, but there's so many people so packed in they can't get to him. So they go up on the roof and start tearing tiles off and lower him right in front of Jesus, right in the middle of a Bible study. And Jesus sees their faith. And he tells the man, your sins are forgiven you. Take up your bed and walk. And the Pharisees' eyes got huge and are like, well, who can forgive sin but God alone? And he says, yeah, that's why I said it so that you know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins on the earth. And Jesus is telling us who he is. He is God the Son, and he has the ability to forgive sins. As he goes from there, he sees a man named Levi sitting at a table, and he's collecting taxes, one of the worst people that you'd ever want to meet in Jerusalem. He's turned in his Jewishness to be a Roman pet, essentially. And he says, come and follow me, and he leaves everything. Boom, just like that. So much so, Jesus gives him a new name. 
He's called Matthew. He ends up writing the gospel called Matthew. And there are over, there are 99, exactly 99 references to the Old Testament in Matthew's gospel, more than all of the others together. So Matthew comes back to his Jewish roots and he understands that Jesus is the Messiah. We talked about how Jesus going from there, Matthew has this wonderful festival at his house. He goes, well, listen, uh, since I'm following the Savior, why don't you come to my house and we'll have a big barbecue. We, you know, we'll break the grill out and have some probably not hot dogs and hamburgers. But And so what Levi does is invites all of his friends. All of his friends, they're, they're all tax collectors and sinners. And so they're having a party at his house. And now these premier teachers that were once sitting in a Bible study with Jesus are outside. They didn't want to go in. They wanted to hear what Jesus had to say, but they weren't about to go in there with all those sinners. And so they were outside. And so they start complaining to the disciples. <laughs> why, does your, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Isn't he afraid he's going to get dirty by being with those sinners? You know this mentality. And so it doesn't matter. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and, and he, when they were complained against, like so many people do against God's people, you know, how can you believe a God in the, the God of the Bible that destroys human life? Well, I don't know. There's like how many millions of abortions in this country and nobody seems to give a rip about an innocent child dying, but oh my goodness, God takes out some Philistines. Oh, that's a reason why I'm not coming to Jesus. No, it's not. It's an excuse. So the Pharisees, being the, the particular people that they were, began to pick on Jesus. And why is he doing what he's doing and giving heat to the disciples? They don't go to Jesus. I love this guy's face. Yeah. <laughs> and Jesus answered and said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, because every patient is terminal. Jesus does house calls. He solves pre-existing conditions. He always has a right diagnosis. He'll replace the heart to all who are willing. And he even pays the bill. And that's why Jesus is a doctor. And that's why the church isn't a place of judgment. It's a place of grace. It's a place of repair. It's a place of rescue. No one having drunk old wine immediately desires new, for he says the old is better. And Jesus is talking about these old wineskins of whom the, the Pharisees were. He says, you can't put this new teaching into an old paradigm. It's not going to hold it. Grace is a very different thing from the law. And if you're not going to be flexible and be a new wineskin, then you're not going to be able to handle what it is I tell you. And that's the way it is for all of us. And there's usually a, a, a curve, you know, when, when we're accepting a new teaching. I don't know about you, but when I hear a new teaching and it doesn't set well with me because it makes me uncomfortable because there's something in my life that doesn't match the teaching and I, I get kind of uncomfortable, I have to kind of pray through it and take some time with the Lord and get used to it so that my heart, like the Grinch, gets bigger and then I can accept it. But first there's denial and then anger and then bargaining and then depression and then finally acceptance. I don't know if you've understood that, but... Uh, it's the same thing as, you know, dealing with your own death. And technology and new things are things that people, re, you know, are very, very resistant to, and some of us more than others. And so if something new is coming about, we tend to be resistant, like the wheel. I'm sure that there were people that protested it. <laughs> Jesus says in Revelation 21.5, he who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. You know, they're good things to remember when Jesus says, write this down. You know, this is important that you understand. I make everything new. And we have to kind of get used that Jesus does that. So this week, we're going to be in Luke chapter 6. And we're going to go through the first 19 verses, God willing. Verse 1. Now, it happened on the second Sabbath. Luke is being very precise here because he's a doctor. On the second Sabbath, after the first that he went through the grain fields and his disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate them, rubbing them in their hands. And some of the Pharisees said to them, 
Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? But Jesus answered them, said, have you not even read this, what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he went into the house of God and he took and he ate the showbread and also gave some to those who were with him, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat. And he said to them, the son of man is also Lord of the Sabbath. So we're going to talk about work and eating on the Sabbath. Any of you have any questions about the Sabbath? I'll take them one at a time. <laughs> the Sabbath is, it means seventh. It refers to Saturday. Saturday was the day in which the Jews set aside because of something that even predates Moses and the law, something God did all the way back in Genesis when he created the seventh day and he put it aside and he made it holy. And on that day, he ceased from all the work in which he was doing. In other words, he did all this creative, awesome stuff up to day six. You know who was created on day six? Human beings. And then here comes the seventh day. And he says, I'm done. It's good. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's the Sabbath. So why do we meet on Sunday, which is the first day of the week? Well, because the Sabbath was already taken by the Jews, so, you know, we had to pick a day. So it picks... Good answer. No. Well, and we'll get into it. Now, it happened on the second Sabbath after the first, that he went through the grain fields, and his disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate them, rubbing them in their hands. So they're on their way to, to, to go to synagogue, and they're going through the grain fields, and they're, they're pulling off some of the grain. I don't know if it was your grain field. Would, would that be cool? Jesus and 12 guys going through your, and pulling, pulling food and, and eating. By the way, they were doing nothing wrong. It actually makes provision for this in the law that you're allowed to do this. And what they would do is pull off grain, whether it be corn or whether it be, um, you know, barley or something of that nature. They would take it and pull the head off. And then you've got all this fuzzy stuff in the shells like you find on peanuts. And usually you do this in your hands like this and you go, and then you have granola. It's a, it's a, it's a very balanced, high carb breakfast that will keep you going through the entire Sabbath. So that's what they were doing. And of course, that wasn't anything wrong. The, the scripture makes provision for that. I brought it up for you here in, in Deuteronomy 23, 24 and 25. It says, when you come into your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat your fill of grapes at your pleasure but you shall not put any in your container. So you're allowed to walk through, take whatever you can and put it in your mouth and chew it up and swallow it. But you can't like fill your pockets, you know, bring a sickle, a combine, you know, while your neighbor's on vacation. That's called stealing. But this is not. And when you come into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the heads with your hand and you shall not use a sickle on your neighbor's standing grain. In other words, you're welcome to whatever it is you can take and eat on the trip, but don't pack your pockets and don't rip off your neighbor. That makes sense, right? Yeah. So if I'm walking by a tree and it's got an apple on it, I could pick that thing. I remember it was a, a guy's yard. We used to climb his eight foot tall fence and go in and, and take apples. And he used to come out with a rifle. <laughs> it was full of salt, but still when it hits you, it, it's painful. So he apparently didn't read Deuteronomy 23. So uh, and we weren't really walking through either. So, so they're not doing anything wrong. It actually provides. But see, the, they had a problem because it was on the Sabbath. And the Jews got hugely fanatical about the Sabbath. And what it is that you have six days that you shall do all your work. By the way, that means you have a six-day work week. So if you're going to digest that, you've got to digest the six-day work week. Any of you want to volunteer for a six-day work week so that you can do nothing on the Sabbath? Well, some of the Pharisees said to them, now listen, they're, they're on their way to church, right? They're going through a field and they start pulling off these grains and I can just see these guys, you know, pop up like Monty Python or something, you know, whoop, oh, oh, you know, and they're pointing at the disciples and sounding the alarm that they're breaking the Sabbath. You're, you're only allowed to, to travel 200 paces actually on the Sabbath. So uh, I don't know where they came from or if they've been counting their steps too, but some of the Pharisees said to them, 
Why are you doing what is unlawful to do on the Sabbath? They said unlawful. It's not unlawful. It was against their traditions, but it wasn't unlawful because they had taken the Sabbath and made it such a huge thing. Just know that you're always being watched. Some are looking for an example. Some are looking for a fault. Both will find what they seek. Some people will look at you because they're looking for, to trip you up. They're looking to find a fault, a reason that they don't have to accept the Jesus you believe in. Then there will be people who look to you as an example. And they'll say, you know, if this person really knows the God of heaven who created all things and sent his son, Jesus Christ, there's got to be something special about their life. I'm going to keep watching. And you know, you find whatever you're looking for. You just do. Jesus said, why do you look at the speck in your neighbor's eye, but you don't notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. You know, if the Pharisees really wanted to make a difference in the disciples' lives, they could have taken them aside quietly. Say, Jesus, do you see what they're doing? Are you okay with that? They could have done that. But you see, they were who they were. They were looking to find fault. And they were looking at this point to roast Jesus because he was able to forgive sins and heal a guy just like that. And so they wanted to put him to death, which sounds like a really crazy reason to put anyone to death. So what are you looking for? I don't know about you, but I tend to find fault everywhere. I tend to be one of those fault finders that I talk about. On my way to work today, I, I came to a light. Actually, last night on my way home, I came to a light. The light for the other people turned yellow and turned red. And it turned green for me, and I started to go. As I started to go, and I crossed, and I got into my lane, I noticed the guy who was stopped at the light, who was really in a hurry and had to stop very quickly, followed me right through a red light. I know everybody gasped. <gasps> Went right through a red light. So, of course, I was ready to stop the car in the middle of the highway, get out of the car, and say, what's, what's wrong with you? I got grandchildren living in this neighborhood. I should. I get that way. I get that way. I see people go through lights all the time. You know why? Because I'm looking for them. I've been watching too many fail videos, and I see too many people have accidents, and now I'm like, I watch every one of you as you come in the store. I want to know who's most likely to be carrying a piece. You know, like I, I just... I have that mentality, and I can understand where the Pharisees get this from. But you know what? I want to be different. I want to be like Jesus. You know, the disciples had no problem doing this in front of Jesus, and Jesus didn't reprove them. I think because they saw him every single day, and they saw the love and compassion that he had, and they weren't worried about him roasting them openly. But these guys did. What we should be doing is finding specks in people's eyes and helping them remove once we've removed the log from our own eye. Amen. You see, the motivation to find a speck in somebody's eye is so that you might be of help. You might be an assistant. But you can't do it if you've got tons of it in your own life that you're not dealing with and you have a heart where you're looking for it in everyone else. You're disqualified. Right. So you've got to deal with your own stuff. And the greatest way to do that is to say, Lord, help me, I'm a sinner. Help me. I need your strength. Because we all do. Amen? Amen? I love that face. <laughs> so these are things from the Mishnah which you are not allowed to do on the Sabbath. These have all been extracted and, and contrived actually out of the scriptures. Sowing, plowing, reaping, binding, sheaving, threshing, winnowing, selecting, grinding, sifting. You get the idea cutting hides into shape, making two or more letters. <coughs> Erasing two or more letters. Do, do you get the idea that they really push the envelope? And, and that's what the Mishnah does. It takes the, the very plain writing of Scripture and people will say, Rabbi, tell me, 
can I do this on the Sabbath? And then they come up with all these answers and then they, they codify them. And then they put these giant burdens on men's backs, which they themselves cannot lift. And yet, anyway, you're not allowed to build, demolish, extinguish a fire. I'm just saying, you're not allowed to kindle a fire. Put a finishing touch on an object, transporting an object between a private domain and a public domain or for a distance of four cubits from a public domain. You see, they even tell you how far you can go with the thing. But it's not found in the scriptures. This is what the rabbis have given answers to, and so they write it all down. And now the Sabbath is this giant burden. God said, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy because on it the Lord rested. And so we're supposed to rest, which means you don't go to your job. You don't work on Sunday. You don't do what you can. And in this day and age, it's a difficult thing. We have people that are working today and they can't be here. Thank God for the internet. But the bottom line is one in seven, take a break. And this was a blessing. When they came over from Egypt, this was a blessing. God's given you a day off and you were slaves work 24 seven. God's given you a day off. This isn't a day off. This is a day of, uh-oh, 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 uh-oh. <laughs> no writing, erasing, tearing, business transactions, driving or riding in a car. And the reason is because when you put the key in and you start it, you make a spark. You know, the scripture says that you shall not kindle a fire on the Sabbath. In other words, you don't take a stone and another stone and go, ksh, 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 ksh and work yourself up into a ladder. Keep your fire going. That's essentially what it means. It doesn't mean not drive a car. There's not a lot of effort doing this. That... <laughs> Shopping, using a telephone, because it makes a spark. Turning on or off anything that uses electricity, including lights, radios, television, computer, air conditioner. Some of you people who like comfort, forget about it. And alarm clocks, cooking, baking, kindling a fire, gardening, grass mowing, doing laundry, no carrying of anything in your hand. And so they developed all these really cute tricks. You could carry it on top of your foot and that's okay. On the back of your hand would be all right. If you could balance it like this, you'd be okay. You're not violating the Sabbath, even though that's much harder than carrying it in your hand. You're not allowed to carry anything heavier than a dried fig. A woman is not allowed to tie a knot. And so if you go and you are going to lower your bucket into the water to get water, you can't tie a knot. Although the rabbi said, it's okay for you to wear your girdle and tie a knot. Because we don't want to see any of that. <laughs> so ladies, you, the girdle is okay. So what they would do is they would go out, attach their girdle to the rope, and then to attach the rope to the thing. <laughs> And this is the kind of stuff they did. If you, you were only allowed 200 paces on the Sabbath. And so if you attached a rope to your house and you dragged it out the day before Sabbath and you went as far as the rope could take you, that was considered an extension of your house. You could only start counting at the end of the rope. I thought this was a day of rest. This is a lot of work. And then what they would do typically, if you know anything about the traditional Orthodox um, Jews, you can get a Shabbat Goy, which is a Goyim, which is a, a, a Gentile like you and me, who comes and does all this stuff for you so that you don't have to do it. But the scripture forbids it. It says you don't have your neighbor or your employee or anybody work on the Sabbath. But they, you, you know. So Jesus is just trying to get the church, you know. There was a fire in 1997 in the Orthodox Jewish community. And because you're not allowed to put a fire out and you're not allowed to use a telephone, they ran to the rabbi and said, Rabbi, is it okay if we pick up the phone and call for a fire department? In the midst of them deciding and thinking, and they finally said, yes, it's okay, there were three apartments that burned to the ground. Because this is how crazy it gets when you are a fastidious lawkeeper. You think you're going to go straight to hell if you pick up a telephone and call a fire department. These are the kind of folks that are legalists. 
and we have to be careful that we don't become them and get that face. <laughs> it's not that it's not a law. It's that it doesn't go with our traditions. They stand accused, these disciples, of reaping, threshing, winnowing, and preparing food. There are four violations of the Sabbath in every mouthful. You see, this is reaping, which isn't, it's just a handful. Like if you're going to eat, do you exert any energy? I mean, is a fork too heavy? Reaping, winnowing, threshing, and preparing food. So they're guilty on four counts of breaking tradition. That's the way they see it. They weren't being disobedient to the law, but this unnatural extension by the exaggerated customs of the rabbis. And they got criticized for it. I'm sure you guys take some heat. You guys have a drum player in your church? Oh my goodness. A lead, guita a lead guitar? You're kidding. You've got to be kidding me. And that bassist, did you see him? <laughs> Don't even get me started on the pastor. Jesus says this of this entire mentality, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering in to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves." Jesus in this section in Matthew 23, these woes that he pronounces on them is because they were so legalistic and they would pray on the corners and they would disfigure their faces when fasting and they would give with the sound of a trumpet and tell everybody what great things they're doing. And none of that is to be the lifestyle of the Christian. Jesus said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Let your, see, let your giving be in secret and God who sees in secret will reward you openly but those who do it publicly, you have your reward. So that's what the Pharisees are doing is criticizing Jesus. Don't be the doctor who tries to help somebody remove a speck from their eye with a giant log hanging out of yours. That's what happens when you get legalistic. Jesus says in Luke eleven thirty four, your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eyes are healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when they are unhealthy, your body also is full of darkness. I think that's connected with the log in your eye. If that's going to be the thing that you focus on is the little imperfections in other people, you will certainly find them, but you yourself will be disqualified from helping them because you haven't dealt with your own stuff. In verse three, but Jesus answering them said, have you not even read this? <laughs> now, by the way, they, they would have the first five books of Moses memorized. Not to mention David, who's their favorite king. Have you not even read this? <laughs> what Jesus did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him? How he went into the house of God, took and ate showbread, and also gave some to those that were with him? Which is not lawful, nor but any of the priests to eat? You see, King David did that which was unlawful. But he's their favorite king. Jesus did something with his disciples that was against tradition, and he's public enemy number one. David did this before he was even anointed king. Jesus is doing this before he was recognized as king. It's a rather interesting parallel. If you remember the story in 1 Samuel 21, David goes with his men. He's on the run from Saul. Saul's trying to kill him. He knows he's the next king. He's anointed, and he's favored by God, and Saul's not doing the right thing. He's trying to have him killed. And in running, he runs to Abathar, the priest, and he says, listen, me and my men, we're really hungry. We're on a special mission from Saul, which is a flat-out lie. He says, you got something to eat? He goes, we don't have anything here. All I got is these 12 pieces of showbread, and this is actually for the priests. It's not lawful for you to eat. He goes, well, come on. You help a brother out here? <laughs> and Abathar says, I'll give it to you, and I'll give it to your men. Have your men been sleeping around? You know, are they... Anyway, uh, he asks them a question if they're ceremonially clean. He says, yeah, we've, we've been running. We've got no time for fluff like that. So he says, no problem. You can have it. And you eat it. And he eats it. So what, what do we get from this? 
human need is much more important than empty ritual. You get an empty, heartless ritual means nothing. Loving people is more important than all of that. Except that's the hardest thing to do because it involves sacrifice, doesn't it? So I imagine all these rough guys showing up all hungry and, and uh, by the way, he gets a sword too. The sword of Goliath happened to be there. And so he was uh, able to pick that up. Matthew 12, five to seven says, or you've not read in the law. This is what Matthew's perspective on this entire event. The Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless. You see, Jesus, Matthew takes this down. He remembers what Jesus said in full. And he says, he told them, don't you realize that the priests, every single Sabbath, they make a sacrifice, by the way. They make a sacrifice every single Sunday or, or Sabbath on a Saturday. And so they're working. These guys are working hard. It's like me saying, you know, you all should take off on a Sunday. You shouldn't go to work. Well, what the heck am I doing? That's the deal. So he says, don't, don't you realize that the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and they're blameless? So what's, what's up there? Yet I say to you that in this place, there is one greater than the temple. He's talking about himself. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Jesus says that you have condemned the guiltless by pointing at my disciples. They didn't do anything wrong. If you understood the scripture, you wouldn't have said that. They knew the scriptures, but not the God who wrote them. You know, that, that can be a problem if you're a Christian. You can know everything that's said, but do you know the one who wrote it? Are you in relationship with the God of heaven? Have you submitted your life to him in every way? Have you accepted Christ as your savior and your Lord of your life? Which means he tells you what to do and you do it. That's a far different thing than having an understanding of the historical person of Jesus. These guys knew the scriptures, but they didn't know the God of the scriptures. The religious leaders revered David, and yet they rejected the teachings of Jesus. Here's a guy that clearly walked over the line, and they, eh, we let that go. That's okay. It was David. Well, he, he also killed Uriah the Hittite. He also committed adultery. Uh, you know, he did a whole bunch of things. He also went and ravaged a whole bunch of people and just cut all their heads off when God didn't tell him to do it. Anyway, so he's, he's a bloody dude, but... It's okay for him. Grace can be bestowed, but not, not if you're going to pull grain off on the Sabbath. We tend to make little things huge and, and huge things little when we're living in hypocrisy. Again, proving the efforts of God's word on any living soul is determined by the receptivity of a prepared heart. God's word will have an influence on you if you let it. The Lord will speak to you if you listen. He'll guide you if you ask him to. But if you're so proud that you don't ask, then you won't get. And that's just, that's just the nature of things. And we have to humble our hearts and receive the implanted word. And he said to them, the son of man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus said, I'm the new sheriff in town. I'll tell you what's legal and not legal. Because there's a new sheriff in town, and it's Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, the one who created the Sabbath. And he created the Sabbath for man. He didn't create us to serve the Sabbath, which is what it turns into. In Hebrews 3, verses 3 to 6, it says, For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all of his house as a servant for a testimony of those things in which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. In other words, the scripture is saying that Jesus Christ is God and he can call the shots. He can make the laws and he can do whatever he wants. And nobody has authority over him. That's why he can tell somebody that their sins are forgiven and they're healed and they get up. That's why he can talk about old wineskins and new wineskins, because he knows. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30, 
just before this event, this teaching arrives in, in chapter 11 of Matthew. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you Shabbat. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says that he is our Sabbath day rest. I don't know about you, but every day Sabbath for me. Every day's a rest because I don't have to prove myself to God. I don't have to win people's favor. I can just be who he's created me to be, forgiven of all of my sins, in repair and on constant journey of being who he wants me to be and constantly getting better and more like Jesus. I don't, what do, what do I have to do? I'll tell you what, walking through a life trying to please yourself, trying to find things to inebriate yourself and not feel pain and not feel spiritual pain and anguish and trying to find things that will fulfill you that are lasting and then waking up in the morning and they're all gone. That is no rest whatsoever. But because we find Christ, we find in him the wisdom of God and the power of God and also sufficient to forgive us of our sins. He fills that God-shaped hole that's inside of us so that we don't need to junk it up anymore with unsuccessful ways. That's what it is to enter into rest because Christ is our Sabbath day rest. So a couple of things we pick up from here. Hosea 6.6 6 says, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. The Lord would rather have us show mercy. You know, it costs you something to do that, to love somebody. It costs you something. There will be a sacrifice involved. It will be your time. It will be your talents. It'll be your treasures. It will be something of you that you pour into another person's life that may or may not be appreciated. That's what the Lord wants us to do show love for one another. That's what real love is. It involves sacrifice. It's not that warm, squishy, ooh. It's I die for you, and you might not ever appreciate it because that's what Jesus did. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. We're not here to serve the law. We're here to serve the Lord. And of course, in doing so, we keep his word. We do those things that he says, but not because they're burdens. Because Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. You will find rest for your weary souls. That's what it is to serve the Lord. Traditions of men are not to be on the level of God's word. And it doesn't matter if it's a church tradition. I mean, we can go back in history and look at all sorts of church traditions. Here's God's word. Here's traditions. Traditions will change as time goes by. God's word never will. Principles never change. But the application of them and what we do here. Well, you have to take communion the first Sunday of the month. No, you don't have to. Actually, the Jews only did it once a year at Passover. So we're like overdosing. <laughs> but we, we choose to do it the first Sunday of the month. Do we have to? No. You know what? I might just change that for the heck of it. So you people don't get too religious. <laughs> you know, we always have five or six songs. There's always one at the end and there's five in the beginning. And then, you know, there's announcements in the beginning. And, you know, we're always sitting in our chair because it's our chair. You know, God forbid a, a guest comes in and sits in your chair. You see, we have traditions and you can get so entrenched in them, you forget why in the heck you're doing them anyway. Anyway. So, quickly, Jesus heals on the Sabbath. It happened on another Sabbath. By the way, this is another Sabbath. But if you're counting, this is the third Sabbath. Also, that he entered the synagogue and taught. And a man was there whose right hand was withered. Dr. Luke knows it's his right hand. So the scribes and the Pharisees watched him closely whether he would heal on the Sabbath that they might find an accusation against him. They're looking for him. They're just looking. This dude's a plant. But he knew their thoughts. And he said to the man who had a withered hand, arise and stand here. And he rose and stood. And Jesus said to them, 
I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or destroy? And when he had looked around at them all, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored as whole as the other. But they were filled with rage and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. What? It's another Sabbath. Jesus is on his way. He enters a synagogue to teach and there's a man whose right hand is withered. It's not an accident. He's in the front row. By the way, if you had any sort of abnormality like that, they didn't make special provision for you when you went to the temple. They put you in the back because apparently there's some sin in your life and that's God has cursed you and you know, you're just very lucky that we let you in here. But he's in the front row, which tells me it's a plant. And they sit there and they watch. I wonder what he's going to do. He's right there. Jesus is right. Watch, watch, look. He's looking at him. He's looking at him. Look, he's going to do it. I know it. And they're waiting for him to trip up by healing this guy. That's a great testimony to the spirit of Jesus, isn't it? That he has this magnetism to the person that's hurting the most wherever it is that he goes. And he feels this obligation to fix whatever they have. Why did the Pharisees do a stinking thing for him? So the scribes and Pharisees watched him closely, whether he would heal on the Sabbath. He might find an accusation against him. It's like you have no compassion? Really? And so you're going to put this guy in the front row and you're going to set Jesus up. And can you imagine being this guy and now sitting in the front row? And Jesus is going to tag him. He knows the thoughts and he knows what's going on. He smells a rat. And he calls on this guy and tells him to stand up and get in the middle of everything. That's like me pulling one of you up here on the stage. Put your radio in the light. Can you imagine? And he's got a hand like this. You know you're embarrassed, right, when things happen like that? You know, you get, you get a little funny thing on your face or a scar or something, and you're, you know, you're suddenly self-conscious. This guy had a withered hand. They were trying to find an accusation against him, but he knew their thoughts, and he said to the man who had the withered hand, Arise and stand here. And he arose and stood. And Jesus said to them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or evil, to save life or destroy? You see, Jesus can ask tricky questions too. Should you do good on the Sabbath or is that prohibited too? <laughs> Apparently a handful of granola is a problem. What about healing a man? So Jesus is angry. You know how I know? We have four gospel accounts and they each remember something else significant about the event. Jesus was angry. You know, anger is not a bad thing. That's like bowling isn't a bad thing. <laughs> Until you hit somebody in the face with the ball and then it's a problem. <laughs> You're supposed to have anger. Somebody comes in here and tries messing with one of you. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll be there. They're probably looking for me anyway. <laughs> Listen, I... I offend everyone universally. I don't have any favoritism whatsoever. <laughs> Somebody messes with my wife or my kids or my grandkids or even if you go through a red light, uh, <laughs> you're picking a fight with me, you know. So Jesus was angry and he was angry at the hardness of their hearts. They have no compassion on this guy and they put him in the middle and Jesus calls him up and says, okay, let's do this. He could have said, listen, let's, let's go on back of the synagogue. I, I, I got something to show you. And he could have healed him in private, but he didn't do it. He called him up front and center and showed everyone. You want to talk about defiance? Jesus is defiant about doing the right thing. But he was mad. And when he looked around at them all, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. But they were filled with rage and discussed with one or what they might do with Jesus. Here in Mark chapter 3, it says, And then he said to them, 
Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent. And when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So when he told this guy, stretch out your hand, he wasn't happy. Stretch out your hand. Okay. Like a drill sergeant. And he did, and it was made just like that. And they were enraged at the healing of a man. They were enraged at the healing of a man. That's like when I first became a Christian, all of my fellow workers hated me. Hey, you don't have to worry about me, you know, plowing you or putting you in a headlock and killing you anymore. You should be happy. <laughs> you don't have to worry about me being high on the job and killing you by accident or on purpose. <laughs> you should be really happy about that. So they plotted to destroy Jesus, and Jesus was angry about it. You know, when Jesus expresses anger, it's not because it was toward him. See, when we express anger, it's because you offend me personally in some way. You know, I'm supposed to turn the other cheek, go the second mile. I get all that. You want to you sue me for my shirt? I'm going to give you my shorts also. It's the Jersey version. It's a little different. That's for incidental stuff, but somebody doesn't want to hear the word of God. Do you know that's, a, that's an eternity changing decision? That's so much worse than getting a tattoo on your face because that's only a lifetime decision. So Jesus was angry and healed this guy as they sought to kill him. They wanted to snuff him out. And this is on the Sabbath. Jesus just said, is it, is it right to do evil on the Sabbath? Well, no. Well, what are they doing? They're breaking the Sabbath. So Jesus sees him as a lamb that needs to be rescued. And apparently he's the only one with the right heart. You know, when we come to Jesus with our shortcomings and our failures, whatever your withered hand is, whatever your susceptibility is, maybe he's telling you today, put your hand out. Jesus heals today. Is there something in your heart? Is there something that's got a grip of your life? You need Jesus' touch. Jesus is here for you. Because he sees you as a lamb. Matthew 12, 11 to 14, Jesus says, and he said to them, speaking of the Sabbath and doing work on the Sabbath, what man is there among you who has one sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will he not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and it was restored as whole as the other. And then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. Matthew, Mark, and Luke give us three different perspectives. Luke does it as a reporter and he gives us all the details. Matthew is there. He's there. Mark is taking dictation from a guy named Peter. He was there. And they all remember different things. Oh, well, see, the Gospels, they all say the same thing. Yes, they do. Three of you, any three of you from church today will go outside and, what did you learn today? You'll say three different things. <laughs> ha, the teacher, he didn't teach those things. Yes, he did. So the Pharisees in constant criticism of Jesus and his ministry. Traditions of men are not to be on the level of God's word. We're to have mercy instead of empty law keeping. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was designed for us to take a rest. Guys, take a day off. Do I have to tell you that? Take a day off. I get to take a day off. Praise God. I get to take the day off. I get to take tomorrow off because I'm in Christ Jesus. Amen. He's my Sabbath day rest and I'm no longer working. Jesus gravitates to the greatest need in the room. I don't know about you, but I have this propensity in me to try to avoid the greatest conflict. And I feel that tugging at me and then I hear the Holy Spirit say, go, I'll be with you. Heartless religious observances are worthless and lead mostly to boasting and judgment of others. And God wants you to love and he wants me to love. 
I pray that God blesses your day today. I hope that the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart. As the worship team comes up, this is a good time to solidify the things that God may have spoken to your heart today. Because you know how easy it is to hit the reset button, get up, and it's time to go eat and do things. And I pray that, in fact, pray with me. Father, you know our hearts, and you know how those of us who have been in Christ for some time sometimes get stuck in the Pharisee rut of law-keeping. I pray, Lord, that you would refresh our hearts, give us new wineskins, that you might pour into us a new thing that you do, that we would serve you out of love as recipients of your grace, as we were reminded today in communion, that our sins are forgiven and that you took them upon yourself, Lord Jesus, that we are free because of you, knowing all of our sins and yet loving us to the end. Help us, Lord, to walk in newness of life. In Jesus' name, amen.